In the previous video, we introduced numerical methods and we contrasted computational with analytical and experimental approaches to scientific and engineering problems. In this video, I wanna talk about the types of codes that are utilized in science and engineering contexts and the programming language that are used, some pros and cons. And we'll work towards addressing this question of whether Python is the perfect language for doing scientific computing. So there are really three types of codes. And again, just like in the last video, I'm gonna talk in terms of CFD, computational fluid dynamics, but the same is true for other areas as well. There are commercial codes, which are codes developed by companies. They sell for lots of money in order to try to make a profit. There are open source codes, and then there are custom built codes. All three of these have evolved over time, and they're kind of a moving target in terms of some of the pros and cons of each. In fact, when I was a graduate student, the open source movement hadn't even started yet, and so that wasn't an option that was available to us. But let's start with commercial codes. So there are general purpose codes and there are domain specific codes. So general purpose codes are things like ANSYS Fluent, uh, CFX, CFD2000, COMSOL Multiphysics, and then there are domain specific codes. So in the automobile industry, for example, Star CD is optimized in some sense for applications in the autom automotive industry. Still basically a CFD code, but it's set up in a way that's easier to apply in automotive industrial applications. Aerospace has its own set of domain-specific codes, some of which are commercial, some of which are open source, I'll mention in a second. So the good thing about commercial codes is they have a company that's behind them. They often provide very good support. You can call someone up, talk to an engineer, tell them the problem you're having, and they can help you address that issue. Open source is really a relatively new movement. It actually started in the high-performance commuting community, and it has evolved tremendously in the last couple decades. Again, there are general purpose open source codes and domain specific open source codes. Basically, open source means, number one, that it's free. And as the name suggests, you have the source available to you. So what that means is you can get the source code, you can therefore modify it, improve it, change it. So you can end up having a whole community, a worldwide global community that's supporting, updating, and improving these open source codes. The big plus that we normally think about is the fact that they're, they're freely available. You can just download it off the web. But the main reason it started was because the source code itself was available. In fluid mechanics, OpenFoam is a very popular open source general purpose code. It's very similar to ANSYS Fluent in terms of its capabilities. They both use finite volume methods and so on. NEC 5000 was developed outside Chicago here at Argonne National Lab. It's more of a research type code, but it's a very comprehensive code and can be used for general purpose types of uh, settings. Domain specific codes, SU squared I highlight here. It's developed at Stanford University. That's S and one of the U's. Uh, NASA has its own open source codes for doing aerospace types applications, turbo machinery applications, and so on. And so the downside to these is because they're free, you're not getting anything other than the code. There might be some limited documentation. In some cases, there's none. For example, the business model for the company that makes OpenFOAM available is that you get the code free, it's open source, but you don't get any documentation. If you want to learn how to use the code, you have to spend a couple thousand dollars, go to their courses, workshops to learn how to use the code. That's how they make their money. So that's the trade-off between commercial versus open source. And so for many industrial customers, they prefer a commercial code where they get that extra support. In academic and research contexts, people love the open source. It's constantly evolving, constantly changing. It's cheap. There's communities that develop around, around these. Now there's also sometimes the need for custom built codes. This is particularly true in research. In research, you're always pushing the boundaries of what has been done in the past and sometimes what you need to do or want to do in your research is something that can't be done using existing tools and you need to develop new algorithms, new methods, new codes in order to accomplish that. It's less common that that's necessary. When I was a PhD student, all the codes that I used in my research, I wrote. Uh, so they were, they were specialized research codes for a particular purpose. Nowadays it's less common even in a research setting to have to write your own code, but it is necessary sometimes. There are various programming languages. There are many, many programming languages, but the ones that have had the most impact on numerical programming and scientific computing I've listed here. They are roughly in chronological order of when they were introduced. 
they're actually all still available. So I list Fortran first because it came first, and it's still actually a very commonly used and popular programming language despite its reputation as being old. So Fortran actually stands for Formula Translation, and this is why Fortran has stood the test of time. It was developed and continues to be developed by the scientific computing community to do one thing well and do one thing only, and that is do scientific computing, numerical programming, extremely efficiently. The problems we're trying to solve can be enormous. Sometimes you have to wait days, even weeks, to get a solution to one problem. So it's all about computational efficiency. So from the very beginning, in the 1950s, when Fortran was first developed, it was developed for us as scientists and engineers. So it's really optimized for our needs. And it's actually more modern than you think. There's a whole community of people that are continuously updating the standards for Fortran, and every so many years a new standard comes out. And what they do is they, they watch the landscape of computer science and other programming languages and tools that are available. They just adopt those tools and so forth that make numerical programming easier, better, more efficient. So it's actually mo much more modern than you think. C++ is the general purpose programming language. The vast majority of applications that are used in your personal life and, and in industry and so forth were written on C++, using C++. It is the general purpose programming language, has been for many, many years. But it is not optimized specifically for numerical programming. You can do numerical programming with C++, but even simple things like taking a variable to a power is not built into C++. You have to write your own function to do that. Then along came MATLAB and Mathematica. I, I list them here as programming languages, and in some sense they are, but they're not really marketed that way. These are software packages. They can be quite expensive that are used by engineers, by scientists and in academic, industrial settings and so forth, used by students. And they're very powerful, um, very comprehensive, but they have limitations. So MATLAB actually stands for Matrix Laboratory, and that was its origins. Its origin was to provide a tool for scientists and engineers and mathematicians to do linear algebra, matrix operations quickly and efficiently on a computer. Rather than having to do a Gauss elimination by hand, you just put it into MATLAB and it gives you the solution. But you can think of it as a high-level mathematical programming language with a syntax that's actually quite similar to C. Now, it's not as comprehensive as C, but the syntax, the way the code looks and the way you write code is quite similar to C. This has been very popular in engineering for, for quite a few years. So you'll find a lot of MATLAB embedded in engineering curricula, in textbooks, in industrial settings, and so on. Mathematica, while the two are both mathematical software and they are billed as competitors of each other, they are actually quite different in their origins and quite different in their strengths and weaknesses, although there is now a great deal of overlap in their capabilities. So again, it's a high-level mathematical programming language. You can do several different types of programming styles, such as procedural, which is kind of the traditional approach, or functional. But the real key to Mathematica, and actually what makes it quite amazing, is you can do symbolic mathematics. So that has nothing to do with numerical methods, but you can do symbolic mathematics. So this is doing what you would normally do on paper, derivate what we call derivations. You can do in Mathematica, and it does all the tedious math for you. It's, it's really quite astounding that you could write a, a computer program that would do that sort of thing. Then finally, I've added Python here. Python's actually been around for quite some time, but it's only been relatively recently that the scientific community has latched onto Python as really, I would say, the best solution for now and into the future for doing large-scale scientific computing. And I'm going to explain why that is uh, in a moment. It actually started as a scripting language. A script is a simple program, usually just a few lines, that automates a simple task. So it's, it's not a full-blown software application, is, but it is a program of sorts to do something relatively simple and straightforward. But over the years, it has evolved to become a general-purpose, high-level, full-blown programming language, really on par with C++. In fact, Dropbox, the software Dropbox, which is so amazing because of its simplicity, was written 100% in Python, which is, is quite astounding. So it is, in a sense, a potential replacement for C++. 
Now Python is not geared towards numerical programming. You actually need add-ons in order to do the numerical programming, but it's, it's very straightforward to do that. It is increasingly popular in scientific computing and data science and so forth. And the reason is because the tools that we as engineers and scientists, data scientists need are increasingly being made with, available within the Python ecosystem. And I always like to describe Python as an ecosystem rather than just a programming language. There's this whole community and this whole ecosystem of tools that are available for and around Python. As I just implied, it's constantly evolving because it sits in the open source side of things. It's constantly evolving. There's new libraries and packages becoming available, new software that's being given Python wrappers and so on. It's, it's really an amazing thing to watch. And I've actually never been so excited about a new programming language as I am about Python. Now in actual code development, it's often the case where you might have an old Fortran code called legacy code that does something, a solver for some numerical problem. And then you have a C++ based front end that calls the Fortran and then does some output, does some visualization and so forth. So there's typically a capability to call from one program to another. And Python is actually perfect for this. It, because it's a scripting language, because it's, that's its roots, it's really great for pulling together various tools and resources within a Python environment. And so I mentioned before wrappers, so you can, it's like a burrito. It could be a simple function that does just one thing. It could be an entire full-blown comprehensive code. And you can put a Python wrapper around it so that to the outside, to the user, it, it looks like just a Python function itself that you can call and communicate with in a very straightforward way. So Python's actually great in this kind of hybrid heterogeneous environment. So what I'd like to do for the rest of this video is take a look at the scientific computing stack. So in computing, you think of a stack, a stack of books, stack of papers. It's all the stuff that you need to accomplish something. So if I want to solve a differential equation, well, I need a computer to do it, I need an operating system, and I need software to, to do the actual calculation. So I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up the stack. So you start at the bottom, and that's your hardware. So that's processors, memory, and storage. Now there's other things that are included in the computer, but in the scientific computing sense, these are the three main things we care about. So there's the CPUs and the GPUs, there's the DRAM for the memory, and there's now the SSD, which is the permanent long-term storage. As we move up the stack, on top of the hardware, which is the actual computer, is then an operating system. So that's Windows, or more likely these days, a Unix-based operating system. So Linux is based on Unix, actually Mac OS. The, the operating system on my watch is Unix based. It's amazing. There's a whole interesting story about it. I encourage you to look it up about how Steve Jobs saved Apple by bringing in a Unix based operating system. Well, the operating system, that's what tells the hardware what to do. Then on top of the operating system, we have our programming languages. So that's what we just discussed, Fortran, C++, Java for doing web-based applications, and Python. And then we have libraries and packages. So you could have a whole host of libraries and packages that are C++ based or Fortran based that you can call from your programming language. They typically do higher level things like linear algebra, statistics, machine learning, parallel computing, and so forth. So let's think about linear algebra. There's something called BLAS, which is a series of very low level routines that do basic linear algebra. So BLAS, basic linear algebra subroutines. And then on top of that, there's LAPAC, which stands for linear algebra package. And they have functions that do things like matrix multiplication, finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and all those sorts of things. So those are written in C++ or Fortran or whatever they're written in. But they provide higher level functions for the user to call to accomplish these things. So I don't have to write my own program to do matrix multiplication, I can just use those built into LAPAC. As you move up the stack, you get to math software. So that's your MATLAB and your Mathematica. So again, this is more like what you would do on paper. So you're not doing the Gauss elimination, you're not doing the method to get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors by hand, the steps, you're just putting in the matrix and saying, give me the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and it does all the work for you. And then you have general purpose codes. We talked about COMSOL. 
There's also Phoenix, which is an open source code that's very similar to COMSOL. Then there's field-specific codes, like for CFD, for solid mechanics, for heat transfer, electromagnetics, and so forth. So we've discussed Fluent, Open Foam, SU squared. And this is what I want to show you and illustrate to you as to why Python is really perfect for scientific computing. So when I was a student, I didn't have Python. So the starting point for me was learning Fortran. So I learned Fortran. Then maybe in my research, I might move up the stack and include use of some of these libraries and packages to do some of the mathematics for me. And you might jump all the way up here and use uh, these, these codes. The point here, though, is everything underlined in red is Python or Python related or somehow fits within the Python ecosystem. So Python here sits as a programming language. You can treat it just like you do Fortran, C++, as a programming language. However, BLAS, LAPAC, R for statistics, stats models for statistics, there are machine learning libraries, there are parallel computing libraries that have all either been ported to Python or have Python wrappers around them. So for example, BLAS is written in Fortran, but it looks to Python as if it's just calling a Python function. Move up the stack. So there are equivalents to MATLAB and Mathematica, even for symbolic mathematics like Mathematica is so good at. And then there's NumPy and SciPy and so forth for doing linear algebra and scientific types of operations. Phoenix is not written originally in Python, but it now has a Python wrapper. Same thing with OpenFOAM, SU squared. So the point here is that you can engage with the scientific computing stack from a Python point of view at any level above the operating system. So you can do hardcore programming in Python. You can use field-specific codes in your particular field of science and engineering that are either written in Python or have Python wrappers so they look like Python code or anywhere in between. And so I can go to an undergraduate class where I want to teach numerical methods, and the best programming environment for them is Python. Once that student becomes a PhD student doing research, the best tool for them might still be, and often is, Python. Go out in industry, become a developer for these codes. Python is an excellent option. It's not the only option. It's not perfect. So that answered the question in my title slide. It is not perfect. But it's infinitely extensible in the sense that it meets the needs, albeit imperfect way, but it meets the needs of people all the way up and down the full range of capabilities. And you as an individual can move up and down the stack as necessary to treat the problems, solve the problems that you have in front of you.